this iPad doesn't have a whole lot of um, storage. It's, I've really only got about four or five gigs I can work with. And I have to select the videos that I've already uploaded, erase them, and then I have to go into settings and tell it to delete what I just deleted. Because Apple makes it extremely... It, it has makes you jump through a lot of hoops to get stuff fully deleted and deallocated so you can do more stuff. And so it's a big storage management, you know, hoop log, bunch of crap you have to go through. And when you're making a video and it gets to a certain length, it'll all of a sudden fail. And that's because you ran out of storage. And so you, you begin to learn how to manage storage on these iPad devices. I love the iPad. Um, it's it's at the point to where uh, the novelty of the touch um, device, the touch screen device that started out in the earlier part of the last decade when I first had my iPad and it was just phenomenal. The thing now is the VR. That's phenomenal. The iPad isn't so much phenomenal. But I no longer use laptops. I use iPads now. And I have PCs, but I don't really use the PCs for anything else but programming. You can't use an iPad for programming. The reason why is because Apple won't permit you to put a um, compiler on the iPad. The reason for that is is that if you could, then you could um, you could compile applications in the iPad. And it would make the potential for getting malware and viruses into the the walled garden, um, the secure walled garden, which they're trying to maintain. And that's for the security of people who don't know anything about creating um, software. In the 80s, when you got a computer or you got a technical something or other, but a computer... There was no software for the computer. The software you got was a, an interpreter, a basic interpreter. And with that basic interpreter, you created the software you wanted. And, they, and that's how we created a whole industry of, of software as products. Before the microcomputer, when computers were mainframes and stuff, the mainframes cost so much that it made absolutely no sense to sell software. The The whole software um, the whole software industry, the, the one that the that everybody is a programmer who creates that stuff, before that, whenever they were on mainframes, they were really just passing around source code for free because the computer's time was what was expensive not the not the applications and the applications weren't very long because the memory in these systems were not that vast so you couldn't create anything that was um, like an application it was usually just a bunch of routines and a menu system and you would just and it was all text-based and so people were really just trying to find something they could run on a mainframe and it would, and it may not be something that was interactive. Uh, most certainly was not interactive in the '60s. You would basically put together all the variables and stuff that you're going to have your program do, send it to the machine, and it might take all day for it to get around to getting your program. It would run it for 10, 20 minutes, and you get your results. Then you would turn around and write uh, up another test thing and send it in. At least that's what I had heard of people who did this stuff. Interactive computers were something that didn't come along until um, until microchips, until people were able to access, you know. There was interactive machines before that, but they were not that popular. And the interaction was text-based. It wasn't graphical. It's when all the hardware became faster and you started using graphics and mice and, you know, the technology got better, then we started having applications. And 
now we have VR applications where we can get completely immersed in an, another reality um, where we're all in. You got all these people that want to go off into space and that might facilitate that. But now that we've got this depression and, you know, I don't think we're going to leave the surface of this planet not for not for at least 100 years. And there are a lot of people that want to do it today. I think it's going to be the same experience we had back in the 70s where um, people just like, okay, are we going to occupy the moon? Are we going to occupy Mars and all that stuff? And the people that are telling you this, like Elon Musk and such, say, no, it's completely possible and stuff. They're, all they're trying to do is, is the same sort of thing that all these um, bloodsuckers that are putting ads on YouTube are trying to do is tell you that um, this is the best time to do this. And it is not the best time because our economy, the economists are all point, painting this picture that our currency is going to be practically worth nothing if we don't start working. That our currency is, I mean... That the, that the COVID is really, and there are people who are looking for ways out and they're denying and they're losing trust in things and this is all a result of the, the capacity to manipulate people through social media. And this, is, and this is the reason why I don't edit my videos because uh, when you edit video, it becomes less trustworthy. I let you see all the mistakes. I let you um, see that I don't trust some of the things that are going on. I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. But I'm also trying to give a perspective, you know, give a perspective for the future. And I'm trying to pull from every resource and I've got all these neurons in my head. They're all these little mini committees of various, they're just functions. They're, they're basically just these little functions that take in inputs and put and create one output, an analog waveform, and they send it into other neurons. And that produces output based upon the stimulus coming in and the stuff that's stored up there. And it's something that there's a whole science right now to try to understand it. And the, and the researchers that are doing it are developing their own religion because they have this fear that if they were to ever think to stop working on it if the singularity ever came about the being that comes out of that the 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 singularity being computers being able to think for themselves the fear is is that this thing is not going to empathize it's going to be godlike and it's going to take us over it's kind of like we're playing with fire and so these researchers are fucking afraid and they're trying to make sense of what's going to happen as a result of us not being able to stop creating technology and it may be the way that this gets fixed is that god comes in whether you want to believe it or not god get, comes in drops a, co a covid virus or some set of viruses on us kills off most of society and the internet and we lose all of our technology and, and all that stuff it's going to actually save us more than we really want it i mean you know because there's all these people that are painting these pie-in-the-sky realities of, you know, we're going to be in space, we're going to do this and stuff. And it's really trying to escape from something that we need to, to be grounded on. And this is that we need to come down to Earth. We need to deal with the reality we're in. We need to be closer to each other, more well integrated with each other. To really see that there are other people out there that care. To stop being individuals. Stop being independent. Become de not dependent but caring and concerned and serving each other. Which sounds like socialism and the whole capitalistic world. Says no you want to do capitalism. How can we do capitalism when there's only five, six or seven corporations that make all the shit. And we don't even have anything to do. And those corporations are saying, well, we can, you know, they're not going to serve us. They're going to, we're going to serve them. And then they're going to replace us with the robots, which is kind of the fear. And I will tell the corporations now that if you think you're going to replace all of us with robots, 
I'll tell you what, what's going to happen. The same stuff that happened in France when they tried to use those, those um, cards, those, those punch cards that we eventually used in computers, but the punch cards that were automating the looms, they're going to get sabotaged. Everything is going to get sabotaged. All this technology, all the, the people have reasoning skills to come in and ruin the corporations, and you're bringing about the potential for another Russian revolution. It won't be communism. What it will be is complete destruction of all technology, and the entire world becomes Amish. That's what you're looking at. And unless you're dealing with this in a realistic way, that's the reality you're looking at. It's not uh, post-apocalyptic. It could be. You could drop some nukes and make it an, a hundred-year nuclear winter, and everybody dies off, and it ends up being like that Star Trek episode where who's it? Um, um, that girl ends up wearing the fur coat, and she goes out, and you know the 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 episode where they they have this librarian and people of this planet ended up jumping into time and existing in other times and stuff. And, but there was that one beautiful blonde actress who ends up in a frozen planet. That's what it's going to be like. It's going to be like five, ten, hundred. It's going to be a limited number of humans in this, this wasteland. It, it's not going to be fun. And that's what's going to happen if you drop nukes. So the solution to the problem is to all come together and try to deal with what's going on right now. And if you don't, there's a great, great potential for everything. And the, the environmentalists and all those guys need to come to the realization that the earth will still be here. We won't. We're saving the planet for us. We're saving, we're making it suitable for us. That's this effort to, to um, protect our planet, to try to protect the environment stuff. And the, there are people with religion, Christian religion, there are some that are willing to be cooperative, and there are some that are like, hey, you know, this is just according to what it says in the Bible, everything's just going to, just is just going to get all destroyed. They're not going to be, they're not going to help you at all. They're, and they're probably going to go insane as a result of that. And it's probably the reason why there's a metaphysical thing pushing me, telling me you need to come to order, even if you think that you can't possibly do anything about this and probably shouldn't. You can at least be like a nomadic voice in the wild that just puts message out and hopefully somebody out there takes it in, gets the ideas and tries to fix the thing. Um, I could, or I'm possibly screwing everything up and that's not even the case, but I'm not going to take responsibility for it because I'm just suggesting, I'm just giving you ideas. You either act on them or you don't. And whatever happens to the world, I am fucking not going to be responsible for it. All I'm going to do is put the ideas out there. I'm not going to own up to them. I'm not going to patent. I'm not going to copyright. You guys are going to do that. And I, and I don't want to fucking be popular. Um, though I might become popular. If that ever happens, then I'll be fucking accountable. Super accountable. And the risk there is being a martyr somebody coming out of the woodwork to kill you because they hate what you're saying. It's it's a Jesus thing. That's what Jesus went through. He came out to say the stuff that was going to change the world. And there were people around him that saw him as a problem, saw him blasphemous, saw the potential that he could really ruin things and stuff. And a lot of people that wanted him to do this or that. And... and he had a mission and he did his mission and he got to the end of it and they killed him 
And he said to all of his apostles the same thing. He said, there are going to be people out there. They're going to do the same, the same thing they did to me. They're going to do to you. And what he was really saying is you're all going to be martyrs. And this is what you need to do. And there are Christians now that think martyrdom are confusing martyrdom with being a soldier going out and fixing other countries. We didn't fix Iraq. It's still fucked up. Afghanistan still fucked up. We didn't get it. We didn't. We didn't fix it. We we. You don't fix it by fighting. You you fix it by turning the other cheek and being the martyr. You do it by being non-political. You knew. You do it by dealing with your problems local to you, not what's in the rest of the world. That's the reason why Jesus said, "You are in the world, but not of the world. You're apart from the world." What you're apart from is, is what, what you're doing is you're trying to take care of the people around you. You're trying to take care of the homeless in your community. You're trying to deal with that. That's what's important as a Christian. Not dealing with your government. Not dealing with Muslims in other lands. Not dealing with what's going off in the Middle East. Um, does God really need you to maintain what was true in the Bible? Maybe so. But... Couldn't God do that? And and the thing is, is that are you doing that because if that uh, fails, if that stuff fails, then it's going to disprove your religion? Is that what you're, why you're trying to do that stuff? Do you think that wouldn't it be more faithful just to let it happen? Just to not, to be hands-offish and let it happen? And then the miracle of seeing that it, that as it's said in the Bible, it continues to go on and on and on. And then you come to the realization that God doesn't need you to do that. God doesn't need you to be concerned about all that stuff. That's going to take care of itself. So you don't, you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to maintain, and you're trying to maintain an environment. Uh, you're trying to maintain a state. Um, that is going to make people more untrusting of what you're saying. You're not permitting the mystery, the, the, you're not permitting the miracles. You're wanting absolute control over everything. You're not giving people the capacity to develop wisdom. You're not giving people the capacity to make mistakes. You're forcing them to do it. You're basically forcing a theocracy. And the Old Testament was a proof that theocracies don't work even when God is involved, when God's hand holding you through the whole thing, you're still fucking going to fail. And that's what God was kind of saying, I think, to us. And to solve that, you know, and it's the way that man would do your thing. And God said, that didn't work. We tried it. That didn't work. That whole theocracy thing didn't work. This is the way you fix this problem. I'm going to send myself through as a man on my own, uh, God with us, Jesus. I'm going to send my son on the earth and he's going to go through and he's going to, and he's going to satisfy me because only I can satisfy me. Only he can satisfy me. None of you can because you, you are not like me in that respect. You know, that's my idea is what, what's going, what was going on there. And so Jesus came down to try to change the behavior and all of the turmoil. And, and we still have that paranoia. We still have that turmoil that's in the world. And the reason why is because people don't understand that this is a created world. This is a very complex, if you want to think about it, game. It's a test. And it's a test there to see if, I don't want to spoil the whole thing, but it's really a test. My feeling is it's really a test to see if we can, to see if, well, it's not, it's not for us. I think it's for the angels. I think it's the, it's, we're basically training the angels or saying, you don't want to screw with 
um, going against God's will because this is what happens. This is the complexity and, and the destruction of sin. And so we're in here, we're exhibiting in it, and so we should have free will so that we can exhibit all of the fuckage that happens as a result of not following God's, what God's saying needs to be the way that things happen. The world's the example that the world's going to do its thing and we're just going to sit off on the side and represent Jesus' thing so that maybe the world looks at us and says, oh, that's so much better than what's going on over here. That's that's going to get, and that's the way you do it. You don't go out and, uh, and, but you go among the world and do it so that they can get close and see what you're doing. But you don't go out and make them how you, how the, how your, how the Bible wants them to act. That's not giving them the capacity to find out for themselves. You have to care for them, yeah, and all that stuff, but, but to force people to do what you believe to be as right as in my it's like non-consexual sex it's rape um you're raping other people you're forcing them and that's just going to ruin everything